provided by NSAC. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming today to our presentation. This is brought to you in part by the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health. And this presentation today is the power of peer support in the juvenile justice system from incarceration to inspiration. So we'll just go through a little bit of um, housekeeping slash disclaimers before we get started into today's presentation. So a little bit about NTAC, we'll give you an overview. This is an, uh, one of our new national centers and the, oops, my apologies. Go back for a second. So the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth and Family Mental Health works to ensure that all young people and their families have the support that they need and desire. And this um, is our multidisciplinary pairing team. Here we have CARS, Center for Child and Human Development, Change Matrix, University of Texas in Austin, MedStar, Georgetown University Hospital, American Academy of Pediatrics, Fredla, and Youth Move National. So our goal at NTAC is that all children, youth, young adults, and families with emotional or behavioral health needs can access evidence-based treatment and recovery services in a well-coordinated system of care. And who do we serve? So we serve all of you. We serve state and local agency leaders, mental health workforce, primary care providers, school workforce, community-based providers, peer supervisors, family partners, youth partners, and our services. So our services at NTAC, there's no cost to our technical assistance and resources. And for more information, we have our website down there at the bottom, but we can definitely send that out as well. And here we go, we are off to our presentation, which I'm really excited about today and you will see why. Um, my name is Evelyn Clark and I'm a change specialist and equity consultant at Change Matrix and work on the NTAC Center. And I will go ahead and pass that over to Ms. Lynn. Hi, my name is Lynn Osley and I'm a certified peer counselor in the state of Washington for uh, Castile Williams and Associates and a partner with uh, our local juvenile justice uh, department. Lynn, <clears throat> how's everybody doing? My name is Tyus Reed. I'm uh, the SPARC Juvenile Rehabilitation Coordinator uh, for the SPARC Peer Learning Center. I live in, I was born and raised in Tacoma, Washington, about 45 minutes south of Seattle. And that's where I'm presenting from today. Great, thank you. And so today we wanna make this kind of more of a discussion between the three of us. Um, we are all certified peer counselors and have all worked together and we'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, we really wanna focus on in this webinar that those who touch the system are the experts. And so, you know, we really want to hone in on their expertise today. First, I'll go through some history of the juvenile justice system. We'll have a leadership academy, or sorry, leadership activity before that, ways to get youth and families involved in leadership, coming full circle, our call to action, and then our closing. Okay, so um, this activity is one of my favorites. And uh, I cannot see the chat. So if Amy or Joanne wanna help me out with that and just name some of the words um, that come to mind in this activity. So just take a look at this picture here and um, just, just let us know what you think when you look at this picture.
I'm saying possibility, strength, diversity, restorative, determination, the future, happy hope leaders, leaders, liberation and freedom, strength and power, successful transformed individuals, diversity, credible messenger, excuse me, credible messengers, overcomer, activists, strong men, all men, leaders, proud men. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So these young people um, are actually individuals who, who, some of them are out now or some of them moved on to the adult prison system, but these are young leaders who reside in Chehalis, Washington at a maximum security facility. And it's a lot of people say sometimes when we do this activity, oh, there's no, you know, um, females in this picture. And so um, this is a all uh, male facility. And so these young people were able to change some of our laws here in Washington state while they are incarcerated. And so this is what we're going to be talking about today is the power of peer support and how the peer working with the individual really does um, make all the difference in the world to have somebody there that understands. Okay, so just a brief history of our juvenile justice system. So our system was established in 1899 and, you know, there's a lot to say about this. We know from history that systems were built on racism and white supremacy and all of that. And so we know that when you think about why the courts were established. There's many different um, research articles out there that talks about this, that talks about the young people, um, you know, it relates it back to slavery and how when that was happening, a lot of our black and brown young people were subjected to um, being confined and it, the numbers grew and they grew and they grew in our country. Um, we have one of the most populated prison systems in the world and also the juvenile court systems. About 1,995 children and youth are arrested every day in the US. And we're gonna take um, a minute to watch a brief video on the juvenile justice history in America. America's criminal justice system has never treated all citizens equal. To understand how we got here, we need to take a look at the evolution of the juvenile justice system. Back before the American Revolution, the colonies followed the common law of England when it came to criminal justice. This means that children were held accountable as adults. In 1646, Puritans in Massachusetts enacted a statute called the Stubborn Child Law. This made child disobedience a capital offense, allowing a death penalty option. But then things started to change. In the 19th century, the idea emerged that children should be taken care of by the state. This notion ultimately empowered the state to serve as a guardian. In 1825, the New York House of Refuge opened for juveniles only. They were called delinquents to distinguish them from criminals. Reformers stressed that delinquents could be reformed, and if properly supported, they wouldn't turn into lifelong criminals. In 1899, Chicago reformers, also known as child savers, many of them disenfranchised women, decided to fight for the defenseless. One reformer, Lucy Flower, had been an orphan herself. The Child Savers pushed for the creation of the first ever juvenile court. This wasn't like a regular court. There was no jury. The judge didn't look down from a bench, but sat at a desk. Julian Mack, one of the first such judges, said a kid should be made to feel that he is the object of its care and solicitude. 
This court was the first of its kind anywhere in the world. Kids didn't get prison time, but instead were put in institutions or, or programs. Like parents, the court tried to steer kids toward becoming responsible adults. Within 25 years, most states started to think the same thing. Juvenile courts popped up everywhere, even in other countries. But for children of color, things were different. They were sometimes banned from houses of refuge or juvenile detention centers. And when convicted, they were more likely to be placed in adult prisons. Under Jim Crow laws, some cities like Memphis established separate juvenile courts for kids of color. A police officer, not a judge, presided over this court. After World War II, Americans seemed to relish the concepts of liberty and justice. The civil rights movement was well underway. Activists began to realize that while juvenile courts were designed to be less punitive, they didn't provide the constitutional rights enjoyed by adults. In 1967, for instance, 15-year-old Gerald Galt was accused of making an indecent phone call to a neighbor. Gerald was arrested without anyone informing his parents. No record was made of his appearance before a judge or the neighbor who complained. Gerald was committed to a state school until he was 21. An adult with the same charge might have received a $50 fine and two months incarceration. Gerald's parents brought his case to the Supreme Court. In 1967, that august body ruled that juveniles were entitled to due process. Then in the 70s, America started rethinking its criminal justice system. Crime had spiked, including juvenile crime. And in 1978, New York City passed the Juvenile Offender Act, a law that made it possible to try kids as young as 13 in adult court for murder charges and as young as 14 for other violent crimes like assault and robbery. That law caused states across the country to reinterpret who could enter the prison system as an adult. They were afraid that a new breed of super predators would sweep over the nation. Today, America incarcerates more juveniles than any country in the world. Every day, 53,000 children are locked up. That's more than a sold out crowd at a major league baseball game. Nearly 60% of these children are black or Latinx. Today, certain rights like the Sixth Amendment and the right to a speedy trial or a trial by jury remains only applicable to adults. Advocates have succeeded in getting almost all states to raise the age at which you are considered an adult to 18. But if you commit certain severe crimes, you can still be tried as an adult in the adult court and serve. What up, y'all? This is Felice Leon with The Root. We are dedicated to bringing you more series and videos like this, and we need your help. Let us know what you thought below and also subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll pull up the PowerPoint for you, Evelyn. And we also have, uh, while I'm doing that, uh, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Perfect. If you review those while I pull that up. So I can read the questions for you if you'd like. Um, so Yasmina has asked a couple questions. The first one is, what is one misconception people have about school and education and the juvenile justice system? Do you, Ms. Lynn or Tyus, want to give it a shot? Go for it, Tyus. I just have something real quick. Just, I mean, and this is, my isolated um my isolated experience and coming from washington state with my experience in the uh, juvenile justice system here you know i came into the juvenile justice system with i want to say about three to four credits from um the public school system between washington state and some of my time in virginia and i mean i graduated i on, not on time you know I was, I was about two years late from my class but, you know, I ended up graduating, graduating from high school with, you know, a high school diploma while I was in the juvenile justice system. So, I, I, I mean, it's not 
you know, we don't got the best of, of textbooks, of course not. And we don't got the best probably funding and, and the best equipment and, the, you know, the best curriculum and teachers. But, you know, um, the thing about the juvenile justice system in Washington State is that um, you, you it's part of programming to go to school. So, you know, everybody has to go to school and there's consequences for not going to school. So, you know, whether you want to do it, it's up to you. And uh, uh, I found that a lot of guys in there, you know, with time on their hands, you clear your mind up. Um, all the stuff from the outs is like not relevant no more. May it be drugs, social media, you know, gang influence, whatever is not really, or gang influence is present, but not, you know, your friends from who you were kicking it with on the outs. So it's a, you have a lot of time to, um, you know, get into stuff and focus on on good things. And, you know, a lot of dudes get their high, and girls get their high school diplomas and GEDs while in there. So, you know, um, I, people, you know, a lot of times talk bad about the education and, and, and school system in juvenile justice system, which is, you know, for there is there is reasons for that. But um, I've just my personal experience, I've seen a lot of, of young men and, and that's my experience because I was in, you know, a men's facility. Um, that probably wouldn't have graduated or got their GED if they weren't in there. And I probably wouldn't have, to be honest with you. Thanks, Tyus. I do want to um, share my son's experience. So he was a youth charged as an adult when he was 17 and he had all his credits to graduate with a high school diploma. But um, because he did not have access to his high school portfolio, which is a requirement in the state of Washington. They denied Lance, my son's um, diploma, and um, the teacher at um, the juvenile center even petitioned the governor to waive that, um, and it was not granted. So he had to finish uh, getting his diploma while he was, uh, when he moved to the adult system. So I'm glad that Tyus was able to take advantage of that in the system. And I think that it's better now. This was five, this was almost six years ago. Um, but again, it's not even across the board and we're in the same state. So there's two different situations there that happened uh, just based on the laws at in between those times. So I think things are moving in the right direction, but there's just the same, same type of scenario with two different situations in the same county, the same state. Can I just add one more thing onto it too, before you move on real quick? It's gonna be brief. Um, another thing that I, I experienced while I, while I was in the juvenile justice system um, regarding school and education is that, and I don't know what they could do about this, but you know, you just have a bunch of people from, um, you have a bunch of guys from just, you know, all in our case in Washington State, we have one maximum uh, juvenile justice center. So everybody from, you know, all across the state go to this one place. So you got, you know, all these these people from all across the state of Washington, from different school districts, um, different grades. And, and, you know, and we're all in the same class. And, um, you know, we're all, you know, each school district and each school system has different curriculum and, and they're at different levels. <laughs> And, um, you know, I'm saying, you know, I was in there like, you know, my first year in there, I was 17, you know, I'll be in class with a, a dude who's 20. And, um, you know, he then went to school in King County. I'm from Pierce County, which is Tacoma. And they're just at a whole different, but we're in the same algebra class. But I wasn't in algebra when I was, and, you know, it was just, it's just like a, a whole mix of, of people and school systems and different, different, mm -hmm. you know, levels all in the same classes and the same, um, and just you know kind of just at the same pace so you know if a person's above where they're at they, they might have to you know do a whole trimester a whole semester taking something that they already took before just because that's what this school system where the institution or this where the institution is located is in a certain school district and that's their curriculum and that's their where their levels are at with their grades you know so like i said i don't know what could what would be the answer for that but that's just something I experienced. I took a lot of classes that I already um, taken when I was at just Raymond Hall, uh, our juvenile, and then I moved to the state. So um, it's a lot of overlap and stuff. So I, I don't know what they could do about that. Thank you. 
Okay, so we'll continue on why the history is important. Is there anything, um, again, I can't see the chat the second, but was there anything, um, did anyone understand the juvenile justice system before we talked about the video? Hopefully that was helpful um, for everybody. So why is this important work? Um, well, we know that two thirds of children and youth who are in the juvenile justice system were children of color. So as I mentioned earlier, um, this system is made up of youth of color. Um, when I was working as a certified peer counselor in Washington state, I worked as the peer who supported the young people in the juvenile detention center. And um, at that time, there were young people of color who made up the, the whole population at the time. And those young people were charged as adults. And I would witness time and time again, you know, young people of color coming in, going to court, them getting, having to stay, not going to, you know, go home on home monitoring or even leave with mental health services. And I would witness their white counterparts have those services in place. And so I started to kind of keep track on my own and realized that in this particular county at the time, we had the highest number of youth charged as adults and they were majority youth of color. And even though there were some who were Caucasian youth that were charged as adults, they got less time in sentencing than um, the individuals of color. And, you know, we can't, um, in our position necessarily change that, but we can also educate court systems and try to advocate in those ways um, when it starts at the beginning for these young people. Um, again, as you see here that black youth represent 54% of youth prosecuted in adult criminal courts. Um, and we know that the population of young people in, in our state where Tyus, myself and, and Lynn are working, that that is true and we have seen it. And that's why we're here is to bring awareness and to, in hopes that each of us can do what we need to do to ensure that this changes for our young people in the system. I just wanted to share real quick that this is not blind to the youth. So my son, is black, Asian, and white, and he um, refers to himself as black. And the disparities that he could see inside um, the juvenile detention center were so relevant to him that he asked me to please tell the judge and the prosecutor that he was white so that he would have a better chance at getting out. Thank you for that. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. I know that was kind of heavy information around the history. And I believe with the work we're doing at MTAC and the work we're doing at my organization that we can make a difference in those numbers, hopefully one day. Um, and so this, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our experiences and how we were able to ourselves from where we started. I myself was in the juvenile justice system. I became a youth peer in Washington state, worked with young people. And one of the visions that I had when I started the work was to empower young people and their families to do this work. And again, I'm very excited because my two co-presenters are individuals that I got to work with as their peer support. And we're gonna just talk to you a little bit about um, some tips to get youth and families involved in leadership roles. Um, one of the biggest for myself was being connected to the state advisory group. Um, and that is every state has one. It's for juvenile justice. And we have the website there if you are interested. But that is a governor appointed board. And with that, we have youth who in our state who are incarcerated doing this work. And Tyus is an individual who actually was on the state advisory group and he can speak more to that um, if you 
want to tie it? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm part of the state advisory group. And um, you know, it's 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 I think the most beneficial for me coming into it, and I came into it as just a youth advocate before I even even got my first job in, you know, social work or or um peer-on-peer -peer mentorship. And um I think the biggest, the biggest way that helped me was having like individuals that are on this call like you guys is like everybody here I've been seeing the chat and seeing where everybody's from you know where you guys go to school at who you guys work for and whatnot and um just being on things like that with important people in important positions and uh important or organizations that you know are the people and are the organizations that actually make things happen and or who can actually do something about these things that you know we go through and um them actually giving me a platform and and listening to me and letting me speak and actually, you know, um, taking what I said and not just, you know, I mean, man, I can't just tell you how many times I was in the JR system and how many people I talked to, counselors or whatnot, who, whatever their label was that, I mean, it was just like, they were talking right through me. They were look, speaking right through me, looking right through me. Um, and they weren't even taking what I said serious, almost like, um, when like a, a toddler talks to an adult and the adult's just like, yeah, nodding their head and, you know, agreeing with it and whatnot. It, I mean, it was just a lot of that, but you know, I'm, I'm 16, 17, 18 years old, 19 years old. And um, yeah, so I'll get into that later, but yeah, um, just being in, being on a platform with, with important people and, and them actually listening and, um, and, and, and hearing what I have to say. And, and, and a lot of what helped too was having people people there and people in the advisory group who know what I who was know what I was saying before you know I was really polished and I knew how to put my thoughts and how I had put my how to put my life experiences into words and how to articulate it in ways that everybody can understand you know not just people from the hood or people from my community people from everywhere can understand you know what I'm feeling and, and what I'm going through and and the emotion and the passion that I'm trying to get across but I don't know how to articulate it and you know just having people on, on the calls like Evelyn and Lynn who can who can who explains you know this is what you know he's really trying to say and 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 part of it is because I've known Evelyn for so long and 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 little Lynn too but you know Evelyn seen me when I first came into the justice system period and and was seeing what I was going through you know for hands on uh, firsthand so um she you know she could speak from her own eyes but yeah just just having that that bridge and then and then putting me on a platform to to know how to articulate myself and how to get it across. Um, that was, is why the state advisory group was so helpful for me and how I've seen it so helpful for other youth. Um, just giving them being being in the same room and the same calls with individuals like yourselves. Thank you, yeah. And that's just one of the many that we have on here. Um, I did wanna mention that picture of the young leaders. They were also a part of our state advisory group uh, for juvenile justice. Um, and so there are two handouts that we want to ensure you guys get. One of them is a youth collaboration toolkit that was written by Coalition for Juvenile Justice. And Washington was actually highlighted and they're interviewed by young people that are currently incarcerated that talk to you about what helps them be involved in different committees, groups, leadership efforts, and what doesn't help them as Tyus just mentioned. Um, and a, a Youth Move National Handout, of course, I love because we can't forget to pay the young people or their families for their time. I know that more and more organizations are paying the young people. And so we hope that the young people and their families can be compensated just as much as the system partners. So I'm gonna just put a huge plug on that piece as well, because we know from our work and my work in the state with working with young people that um, tokenism is very real. And we want to make sure that we're not contributing to that as system partners. Awesome. So just as I mentioned about tokenism, um, it is definitely real. I myself have witnessed young people at the table that 
um, where unfortunately, you know, it was a good thing they were there and it was clear as day that they were um, a token for the meeting. And so what I mean by that is just, you know, as this quote says, it's really allowing the young people, especially those who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color to really take the lead. And, you know, I mentioned the pay, I mentioned, you know, the treatment, and I'm going to I'm going to hand it back over to Tyus because I know that he has some experience with this um, as being the, the other, you know, on the other side of the table. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And um, to to be honest with you guys, this is this is probably going to be the quickest thing you hear from me today because I mean, it's I mean it's it's really cut and dry. I mean, tokenism is wrong and it happens, and you know. I'm not gonna lie, when I first came into this, I mean, not even when I first came into this, since I started getting involved while I was still at JR um, with, you know, whatever types of groups and they for sure weren't paying us, but, you know, they would be like maybe a pizza party or I don't know, some sort of incentive and just to sit there and, and sit on a call and, and just to sit there or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'd be okay with that because and the, most of the dudes would be okay with that because, you know, we were in jail in our certain situations and you know, uh, it's whatever, but it's really more detrimental to the whole movement and to, to the people that we're trying to help to have these, these faces up there and not really be helping. You know what I'm saying? And it happens a lot. And, you know, I'm sure Evelyn can speak on, um, you know, cause she, she's, um, you know, she's a Latina and, and she can speak on that end, but just, you know, being a black man, I mean, it's just like they put they want to put your face up there and, and they put your face up there and uh to be like you know see we checked out the box you know we have a black youth right here but it's like you know what what what's changing for me on a day-to-day -day life nothing nothing changes for me um i'm not seeing stuff get better um you know it's just like it's like i'd rather not even be up there if if you are going to do stuff to really actually help me and help, you know, my day to day life and help my, you know, people around me and my peers and my family. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I'd rather not be up there at all, you know, so I don't know. I, I've, I've been a part of a couple of tokenisms and, you know, or I've been token. I don't even know how to say it. I've been tokenized a couple of times um, early on. And um, now I learned how to flip it. And I think that's just what we have to inspire our um, youth who this happens to. And, and not even just youth, anybody can be tokenized. So I think we just have to inspire them and equip them with the tools to flip the script. Um, you know, you could try to tokenize me, but uh, you, give, you give me a platform and you let me talk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what I'm going to say regardless. And I'm going to uh, uh, do what I'm going to do and feel what I feel regardless. And, um, you know, I, I learned that. And uh, so, you know, that's how I flipped it. So, you know, but, you know, it, it still happens today and it happens at all levels. Like I said, it's not even just youth. I mean, I'm sure everybody on this call has their own opinions of, of cases they've seen tokenism. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's more detrimental because it's given the, it's given the appearance that we're moving forward, but it, in really in the back and, and behind the mask, we're not really moving forward. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's making people think everything's good. And now more time is passing and everything is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just add to that too. Thank you, Tyus. Um, you know, if I could go back. So one of the things that um, I was able to do in the state was develop the State Advisory Group's Youth Committee in partnership with the Office of Juvenile Justice here and some others. And one of the things that I wish I could go back and was really put in place about, you know, well, okay, we're gonna prepare the young people to be on this governor's board. They're gonna do amazing things like change laws and, you know, be able to present at conferences and do this work that Tyus is doing right now. And, and we forgot to talk about, okay, so what happens when you embed a young person or their family into a system that is well-meaning, but has been built on what it's been built on, um, where there's a lot of people who don't look like them at the table. How are we gonna prepare them to, you know, to be discriminated against, you know, where there's gonna be a lot of microaggressions, especially when you talk about peer support, you know, we are vulnerable and 
we know that we have been in this system ourselves or our family members have. So you have that. And then you also have, again, just, you know, there's a stigma on, you know, families and youth in the system. And so how do we make sure that when we are embedding young people into these things that are so meaningful, I know that leadership is a huge component to help mental wellness for our young people and families. And we need to also prepare them for these systems that we're trying to change as well. So I just wanted to plug that in real quick. I see a question in the q and I don't know if it was before, but um, Yasmina said, how do you flip the script now? What would you tell a young person looking to do the same? Um, and, and that's a tough one. So honestly, my, my, in my case, I had support. I had support, um, obviously outside of the, the organizations or the people. And sometimes it's unknowingly low. So, you know, sometimes it's not malicious. I don't know, but I just, I would like to think sometimes it's people tokenize you and they really have true good intentions in the heart, but they just don't, you know, they just don't know. They don't know no better. And I've seen that probably more cases than not, right? So, um, most of the time, nobody's going to bring you on anything if they don't really like you or they don't really, you know, want you on there, but they just don't know no better that they're tokenizing you. And I, really, my definition of tokenizing is bringing you on to something like Evelyn said, having you sit right there on, on a call on a meeting and not equipping you with the information, knowledge or um, skills to express yourself and advocate for what you want to av be advocated for. You know, a lot of you just inviting me and have me sit there and then me not knowing what to say is not helpful for anybody. So um, the best, the way that I flipped the script was I spoke with my mentors, they equipped me with my slow skills and those knowledges and um, information. And when I did get tokenized and I was brought to those meetings and I was brought to those Zoom calls and they did say, Tyce, do you have anything to say? I said, yes, I did. And uh, they weren't, I'm pretty sure the people who invited me weren't expecting me to say that. And you know, I, I said what I had to say. And um, that's the way I flipped the script. And that would be my advice. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna wrap up the history and leadership opportunities that we have been talking about and, and just really think about how we need to dig, dig deeper. Um, all of us that are in our roles we need to look at, you know, what is happening with our young people. We know that 70%, and I would argue that it's higher, of young people have an unmet mental health diagnosis who hit the juvenile justice system. I really believe it's more because one, I was that youth in the system and my culture where I come from, behavioral health, you know, there's stigma. There's um, a lot to say with that. And if we're not looking at what is happening to our young people and our families, where they're living, where they have to, you know, walk to school every day, we have to really think about this. And when we think about, you know, juvenile crime as a whole, are we thinking about it as a public health issue? I was really, really proud of King County, Washington State, that they declared juvenile justice, juvenile crime as, as public health, because it is, it's something that we need to really dig deeper in and really start in the community. Tyus or Lynn, do you have anything you want to add to this to, to humanize this piece? I just wanted to say, I think somebody said it in the chat, but um, that we need to honor youth and family voice. I think that's perfect. That's how we're going to dig deeper is honoring, acknowledging, and taking action. Yeah, I just agree with Lynn. I, I'm not going to add anything. I feel like I've been talking too much. So I'm going to just... <laughs> no, we're all here for you and Lynn, really. We're here to hear your guys' experience, because this is what's gonna, like, as we all said, what's gonna really change systems. All right.
Okay, so now we get to get to the part, the meaningful part of the conversation today. And we just really wanted to bring this full circle. Um, again, when I started, I just, you know, I like, I knew I'm like our young people and our families, they have to be the ones doing this work. Um, I came again from the system, but I ended up working in a different state of where I grew up and I got to meet um, these individuals that are on the call today, Lynn, and we'll go ahead and um, just have a conversation about how we met and how peer support is one of the most powerful tools in our toolboxes. Okay, I didn't bring any tissue, so don't start. <laughs> Um, that's my son Lance in the picture there. He was a youth charged as an adult when he was 17. He didn't have any priors. He just chose to made a choice and it put him in the system um, and in the adult system. Um, that's where I met Evelyn because Evelyn was my son's unofficial unofficial peer. Um, we had a program for him to get mental health services in Washington State, but he didn't have the right insurance. And so he couldn't have access to a full peer, but Evelyn was working in the system and was able to still reach out to my son. And he didn't want to hear anything that his mom had to say. And he was just going through a, a lot of pain and hurt. And he was able to create a relationship with Evelyn where he had trust. Um, and he felt that it was somebody, it was, she was somebody that understood him um, and wasn't judgmental towards him. And in a nutshell, I say that Evelyn saved not only Lance, but she saved our family. Um, Cause this was truly our, our nightmare. And I know that we couldn't have made it out without her support for Lance and our family. Um, and I'm just so grateful that she has steered me towards this work. One second. Unfortunately, I'm in the, our downtown area where the sirens are unfortunately a common uh, theme in the background. So I apologize for that. Um, but Evelyn really saved our family and really steered me into this work once I came out of my nightmare and kind of woke up. Um, she guided me towards working with some of the communities in the county and mostly working with the juvenile court system as they were uh, implementing a family council to uh, share their experiences that we had with the juvenile justice system as my son was uh, now in the system. And so what more better place for me to share my voice than with the people that had my son and were making my son's life decisions for him in the system. So um, I became a part of that family council with implementation. I now lead the family council um, as a facilitator, um, encouraging families and youth to collaborate with the juvenile justice system to ensure that we are putting um, our words into actions and not tokenizing families or youth, but really working together to make a change in our, in our county. Um, I think when my son was in the juvenile uh, center in our, for our county, there was 22 youth. Evelyn, you can, probably, you can correct me, but I think there was 22 youth. And I think right now in our county, there's 10. Um, so that's a huge, huge um, progress there. Um, not, it's not perfect, but just that we're allowed to sit at the same table as these, uh, the county members are making policy changes that involve our community um, is a huge uh, positive impact that we've been able to have. And 
I wouldn't have been able to have that without Evelyn. And I'm so uh, partial to Tyus and the work that he's doing and the more power that we can give our youth and our families um, to make change, that's how the change is gonna, that's how where the change is gonna happen. It's not gonna happen from uh, not without collaboration um, and also that human touch of hearing family and youth stories. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lynn. And Thank again, you. I just, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm so appreciative of your kind words and know that, you know, I, I'm just like, it's, it's so amazing to do the work of a peer because, you know, you hear those words and you really just like, wow, we're just doing my job. <laughs> and, you know, and, but it's amazing work. I mean, you know, this is what we get to do and really empower people, especially young people in the juvenile justice system. There is not a lot of peers who work in that system just yet. We will mm -hmm. get there. Um, nationally is our hope, especially with, you know, the work with NTAC. And so we know that, you know, we, we know we can all be familiar with if we're in mental health that we are not our diagnosis, right? We, we help people with that. And well, also the same thing for young people in the juvenile justice system, they are not their crimes. They have unmet behavioral health issues. They have trauma and it's not justifying, you know, crimes, but it's giving the why. And it's in, in hopes that we can start at the early end of the system. Um, but yes, uh, thank you again, Ms. Lynn, for sharing. And um, I think that another thing she missed is that she is now working as a full-time, um, well, she's, she's really doing a lot of work right now with the agency she's working at with the peers and the services. And her son, you know, is, is doing good. He's his self was, I believe, Lynn, wasn't he trying to do some peer-led groups where he was at? And Yes, he yeah. is. So he's worried about those youth coming in that are his same age or younger. So he's trying to work with his counselor on putting a program together to help those coming in that he definitely can relate to. Awesome. So now, Tyus, go ahead and take it away. Um, thank you, Lynn. That was um, that was a, a amazing story. Even though I already well, and and it seems like every time she 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 uh speaks, I learn something like you know new about her, something that I didn't know about her, but um. You know, I just want to uh, thank you for always being there for me and being a mentor in my life and in the professional field and and you know just my mental health and that. So thank you for speaking. <clears throat> so uh, I I don't want to drag this out and make this long, but so um, yeah, I went straight from the public school system to the juvenile justice system. Um, I was 16, turning 17, and I got arrested, and uh the first ever place I was at so there was a lot of ups and downs and there was a lot of stuff that um that happened in my time um that that picture that you've seen earlier those um individuals and in fact all those dudes that you've seen on those pictures I was um those are all my friends and I was in incarcerated with everyone in that picture except like two of them and um you know and, and some in those pictures I've even known for years and know their moms and and their whole family and um, the first place I ever went to, I remember I went to uh, I went to Pierce County Jail, you know, and then they were going through the um, proceedings to see if they were going to charge me as an adult or if they were going to let me stay in um, in Jr. And actually, actually, I skipped a part before that. I met Evelyn real brief, um, like my first three days in in there. Um, I met Evelyn real quick, and uh, before I even went to court. And uh, she spoke with me and I just remember like, you know, I was in a bad state of mind. So it was even hard to, for anybody to say anything and, and for me to listen. But, you know, I just remember um, she, didn't, she didn't even ask me what I did. She didn't ask me what I was in there for, you know, what gang I was in at the time. She didn't, none of that stuff that I was expecting. Um, 
he just asked me how I was doing, had a quick conversation, a normal conversation. And I, I haven't had that since I've been in there so far. And then, you know, she was gone and, and they searched, they moved me to the adult jail. Um, I was in the adult jail for probably about six months. Um, they passed an act over here that's called PREA Act, um, where, where juveniles, even if you are being charged as an adult, you can't be in the sight or sound of um, adults, which, you know, I was actually surprised that they had us inter, in around and intermingled with the adults in the, um, in, the, in the jail, in the adult jail, while we were still juveniles, and they were trying to figure out if we were being charged as juveniles. So I got to go back with um, people my age. And then that's when I started speaking with Evelyn. And, um, you know, as I was going through my court proceedings and trying to figure out how much time I was about to do, you know, I just remember, and, you know, I say it all the time and it just always, a lot of the meetings stuck with me, but just the one that stuck with me and, and literally just, I mean, she seen the light go off and I, it never turned off. And, you know, I just, you know, I didn't expect that. I, you know, I didn't think I was going to just keep on this, you know, um, with the peer counselor stuff, but, you know, I remember she told me, you know, Ty, when you get out, you could do what I do. And I just, you know, I was just like, I just really couldn't believe it. But, you know, she was serious. And, and my relationship with her leading up to that time was, you know, why would she lie to me? We, we built this relationship. She wouldn't lie to me. And um, I'm just sitting here. I got orange slippers on. I got a jumpsuit on. I'm just like, you know, I don't even know how much time I'm going to get at this point, you know. And I'm just like, man, she's just trying to be nice. She just, she's being nice to me. She's just, you know, she's not trying to make me feel bad up in here and, and have me go crazy and looking sad. So I was like, you know, all right, Evelyn, I, I, I'll get this. I'll, I'll be a peer counselor when I do it, when I get out. This is something I want to do. You know, if I can, I would. So um, long story short, I go on with my time. I leave that place. Um, I go to our state facility and you know, where you see me in that 2017 picture. That's where I graduated high school. Um, that's where I went through a lot of ups and downs in my life. I mean, just that's where I grew from a teenager to a man, to a young man. And, um, you know, it, it, if I just never had that support, that constant outside support, you know, I always had it from my, my grandmother, which she's the lady who raised me and my mother. And, um, but you know, at the end of the day, that peer to peer support, there's nothing that hits home like that because at the end of the day, I love my grandmother and my mom and I respect everything that they've said to me. But, you know, at the time when you're a young teenager in the streets, especially a boy, and this is coming from a woman, you're just like, man, grandma and mom, they're just trying to look out for me. They're my grandma, they're my family, you know? But Evelyn, you know, she's telling me this stuff that my grandma and my mom been telling me. I mean, she, I mean, she has no, she has no stakes in the game really. You know, I know she, she, I'm, I'm, you know, she's fond of me, but, you know, I mean, it's not going to make or break her whether I do good in life or not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what's in it for her, right? Why is she telling me this? Because it must be true. And I was just, I mean, it was just like, I've never had that, that type of support from somebody that wasn't in my family. You know, that type of positive support from somebody that, you know, I'm just like, oh, I'm, they're my family. So that's why they're saying that. So it was just different. Nobody's ever spoke to me like that. No teacher, no nothing in my life. And um, I was just like, wow, even in this bad situation, like, you know, it's so easy to, to just speak down to me right now. Cause you know, I'm what, you know, America looks at like what a young black teen should be. If we're just being honest, you know, I was in there, I, you know, I was in there for, you know, a gang related offense. You know, I had the braids, I was, black you know I looked the part from Tacoma I mean it was just so easy for her to disregard me as another one and just you know look and talk to me like most most did and she didn't and from that I was just like you know whatever it is I want to do that if I have to whatever I got to do to get to that point that's what I'm going to do to get to that point so you know I went through it and then um and a lot of stuff has changed in the state. And, and man, I just thank Evelyn for being a part and everybody who was a part because, you know, unfortunately I wasn't a part of, I didn't get to get in before they changed it to 25. So when I turned 21 on my 21st birthday, I had to go to a uh, prison. I had to go to the DLC system for uh, 12 months, you know, and, and, and the prosecutors specifically did that just so I wouldn't go to a group home from JR. So I wouldn't get out early. So that was the only way that they could do that. And, um, you know, I took that and, and I just, I just, 
and I'm getting off t- topic here, but I just don't want, I'm so glad that changed because I don't want any that to happen to any other youth ever again, because man, it is such a drastic change and it's so different. And, um, okay. And it was so different. And um, it, it, I could have easily not made it out the DOC system. It was, I mean, it was way, way more serious and it was just way different. And um, that was just a permanent thing to do to me as a teenager and to just, you know, not to check in with me, you know, let's talk to Tyus after two years, after we sent it to him, let's see how, see what, see what's up with him, right? Let's, I mean, I, I did five years, two, three and a half years, you're not, nobody's gonna check up with me anything. So, you know, um, it was just like, I laid through where the key on me and um, that stuck with me too. So when I got released from DLC now, fast forward, I, I, I come and I meet Evelyn and um, we have dinner or no, we don't have dinner. We have coffee. And she was like, so look, remember I told you you could do what I do. I'm going to invite you to our local Fisbert, which is a group um, in, in our counties. And uh, it's just a bunch of, you know, county activists, uh, people who work for certain organizations, parents, everybody. And uh, Lynn is the leader of ours in here. And, um, you know, it's just a place to get your name out there and, and to talk about what you want to talk about in the community. So I spoke, people see me and um. I just started getting involved and, um, you know, even with, even with me changing my life and even with just changing my characteristics and my habits, I still had to deal with being a black man with a felony out in this world. And mind you, I'm 22 now. I was 17 when I went away. I went straight from the public school system to JR to DOC and then to out and then out. Okay. My bad. And then, um, yeah, so yeah, so you know, um, how I'm, why I'm here today, why I'm talking to you today is because of peer 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 on peer relationship, and um, you know, I struggled with with getting into this field. There was a couple people that that see me that didn't have the progressive mindsets that were were concerned about my felony, and um, you know, there was another situation where HR it was just a timing situation, and um, and uh, there was just you know, I had to wait a certain amount of time to uh. To, to be brought on the team because of, you know, the time that I was, com- my conviction. So, you know, it was, um, there was a lot of ups and downs, but um, I, I would say one thing that, you know, if I never met Evelyn, if I never had that peer on peer, you know, human um, interaction and, and just that person that actually believed in me and didn't have no reason, nobody was, you know, there wasn't no reason or secret motive behind her believing in me, inspired me. and. Um, you know, I just thought I have to give back. I've seen the end of the road. I met the guys who have life. I have to give back. So nobody goes down that road unknowingly because I didn't know. Nobody ever told me it was at the, at the end of that road, what was really at the end of that road. I'm sorry. <laughs> I spoke too much. No, don't apologize. You did not speak too much. <laughs> this is why we're here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to skip the call to action, but I did put it in the chat so you're not off the hook. <laughs> and then we're going to close out with some questions that we have. All right, Lynn and Tyus, do you have yours pulled up as well? The question and answers. So um, I saw Yasmina had one earlier that I missed. I do not know how many youth are arrested on school campuses. I do know it happens. I think we all know that. Um, and so we, I can definitely look into that and get that information, which will be good for our school-based team. In our county juvenile justice system has data on that as we've been working on um, probation transformation and we have been able to identify the number one school district in our county that is the uh, refers the most kids to our juvenile detention center. So we are trying to collaborate with that school district to identify how we can work with youth and families um, and provide them resources and not use um, detention or the police as the reason um, or as the method of solving uh, opportunities at the school district.
Yeah, I see some of these are a lot, there's a lot of questions about peers in the system. We don't have time to answer all of those. We are at time. However, uh, myself or any of the two other panelists are available for that information. If you want to contact us directly, we can help you with that as well as our NTAC Center. All right, thank you, Tyus and Lynn for sharing today. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, we appreciate all of you. Guys, I appreciate you guys. You guys have a good day. And when you uh, log out of today's webinar, um, a survey will appear for everybody. If you could please take a few moments and, and answer the few questions for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, it helps us tailor our future trainings with what you're looking for and what you're needing. Um, and it's also um, required part of our funding uh, to keep, re keep receiving the funding to provide these no cost trainings and, and um, products for, for everyone. So if you could take a few moments for that. And also in the slide deck that was sent out in the reminder, um, and then also I attached it in the chat box. Um, here is the contact information for the Intact uh, TA Center. Uh, you can contact us for any questions you might have or any technical assistance that you might need. So thank you again, everybody for joining us. And we will see you on another webinar. Have a great day.